Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here. Day three of our media week. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, your host. We are here as part of our CUBE East studio, partnering with Brian Bauman, the NYSE Wired community, bridging the two networks together, Silicon Valley and New York, bring in wall-to-wall -wall coverage to Wall Street here, building out a network in New York. Great founders, dinner, uh, reception the other night, top AI founders are here. We got another co-founder here, Rob Skillington, who's the co-founder and CTO of Chronosphere. If you know theCUBE, you know we've covered this founding story and great team, great founding team, doing exceptional work and observability. Rob, thanks for coming in. Thanks, John, for having me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what do you think? Yeah, it's not uh, bad. Not too shabby here, huh? I think the uh, it's it's a as I was saying, a perfect place to shoot from, given <laughs> the energy, the you know the creators, the innovators. Yeah. The oldest trading uh, trader on the floor. Um, uh, Peter, who's called the Einstein of Wall Street, great foot, digital footprint. Um, it's like a Super Bowl here. Uh, <laughs> IPO this morning, uh, just a lot of action. But really what I love about this location is one, the people here are great, um, real community oriented, they work hard, they play hard. But New York is popping with entrepreneurship. We've been seeing it for many years to come. When you go back a decade, you know, it was a tech scene, but it was a little bit smaller. Yeah, now, I mean, even with the huge city that it is, I call it the big ant hill that everyone comes out at lunch um, to eat. And yes, it, it, yeah. I was, last time I was in New York, I was literally walking down the sidewalk and I heard people talking about tech. Yeah. Cloud native tech, by the way. I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. Yeah, that, this is uh, random. And rare. Really, it's like, happening a lot and there's a huge entrepreneurial. So yeah. we're starting to see for the first time Silicon Valley and New York really becoming epicenters because mm the business productivity with cloud native, not only did the cloud help scale the labor on the tech side, it's scaling up the apps. We see the ecosystem on top of the clouds. Now you've got distributed computing with cl cloud hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, and now Gen AI is mm -hmm. just taking advantage of all that data. Yeah. So anyone who is doing any work with data, predictive analytics, BI or anything, they're yes. right in line with a perfect storm for growth because now the applications are getting mm. smarter, the developer frenzy and open source is going crazy, so yeah. the frothy appetite from developers, yes. people who are building mm. are going, wow, I got to get this thing stable, mm. we're building more than we thought mm. yeah. because now AI is putting a lot of pressure on people and so there's, there's needs to kind of get this thing up and running, so the questions all come back down. We'll mm. hear it at KubeCon in Salt Lake City. Okay. Kubernetes has got to be stable as a rock. I need observability. I got to have all the tools in place yeah. because I got to get that next story up. Yes. Foundation's got to be locked yeah. in. And honestly, I think that in New York, uh, you know, when we opened our, our Uber engineering office in 2015, um, I was there 2014 to, to 2019, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of, I say, technology forward uh, teams that were built to, purely out of New York, but there's a lot of great deep talent for, for data, um, and obviously FinTech would been here forever. And so merging of that kind of like technology first businesses yeah. alongside the deep bench of data talent yeah. and other talent yeah. uh, here in New York, I think is, I think you're right, I think it's been yeah. an explosion of um, basically specialists building on top of some of the latest technologies. Yeah. It's, and it's and what's great with the NYC, they're opening up their, their platform too, they got the American Stock Exchange coming in. They got this new. They got more IPOs coming, but I think you, you bring up a good point. I mean, the Cube was started 15 years ago when I met Dave Vellante. We started mm. partnering together, mm. building this out. Mm. Uh, Hadoop was the big deal. Yeah, that's and right. <laughs> big data in New York was one of our favorite events, and we could just never, mm. you know, you know, we're self-funded, so we never. But we have a huge fan base here. We have a huge audience here. To your point. Mm. They were hungry to go uh, jump on big data there. I mean, yeah. if we were in consumer business, credit cards, mm -hmm. big data, fraud detection, security. Yes. And all the banks are using it. So, you know, this market is hot for data. But now, as people are co locating headquarters, Google's here. Yep. I mean, the startups here are incredible. Yeah. Uh, the vertical markets, business is here. Yes. So yeah. business productivity is where we're seeing all yeah. the conversations where, you know, the old model of IT serves the business. Mm. You remember those days? Hey, yes. you know, I got a new, new employee. They need a PC at their desk. Give them a virtual desktop. Okay, <laughs> IT's done. VMware, put the yeah. switch on top, of the, <laughs> put on top of the rack. Okay, more servers. Okay, great. They did their job. Yeah. The new IT is platform engineering and mm -hmm. now business owners who have domain-specific information mm. because the value creation is coming from the enablement of how fast the data engineering and platform engineering gets to the app enablement. Yes. Agentic is coming, it's not yet here, but it's coming fast. So, okay, we know that's coming. So take me through what you guys are looking at right now, because you know, I bring this up all the time in Chennai, there's really kind of no good answer, but mm. I asked the observability question mm. around mm. Um, data. What's your resilience strategy? Resilience strategy resilience around data? And, uh, it's yeah. a hard answer because yeah. 
recovery oh, yeah. is hard. Like, I mean, cyber resilience today is about ransomware. How do I recover from a ransomware attack? Yeah. Okay, that's easy. But as we start building these mm -hmm. platforms, enabling horizontal scale, yeah. enabling cloud native services, I mean, you got to get that right. Otherwise, yeah. Gen AI can't work because then the data won't work. Yeah. So, so take, take your, what's your position on this? Yeah. So I guess like you know, both me and Martin, uh, my co-founder uh, and the CEO, and I, uh, I'm on the technology side, but we both work together at Microsoft, right? And I, I think like we were building cloud services uh, and working on Office 365 together, and and I think like there was been a, you know, that was taking a large existing service and putting it in the cloud. Uh, but really not much around the architecture was changing too much. Uh, and then, but when we, you know, again, uh, re-met up and, and, and worked together uh, here in New York on, on Uber's platform engineering team, we found that, you know, ar um, apps and services and businesses that were architecting new things in, in a cloud native way had far more moving pieces, <laughs> small individual moving pieces. In fact, I think Uber had yeah. 4,000 microservices, two per two per developer at one point. So, you know, the, the complexity and the uh, <laughs> resilience story is really hard and difficult to, to, yeah. to achieve. And I think observability had to fundamentally take a leapfrog motion during that time. And uh, that's, you know, obviously why what, what our experience that we um, uh, had there kind of let us see that this was clearly a, a uh, landscape shifting moment. And, and I think what was that the founding story? Hard. I mean, I, I don't think we ever talked about in the queue, but mm. did you guys just come to each other and say, hey, this is a bigger problem. Like, I think this gonna, everyone's going to have this problem. Because Uber did a lot of pioneering things. Yes. I mean, they basically yeah. built the first data lake before mm -hmm. Databricks even coined it. Um, managing That's databases, you mentioned the microservices kind of sprawl that happened. That was just evolution of you guys. What was the founding story? What was the origination story? Yeah. So it, it, it was, uh, you know, I, th I think fairly organic, really, uh, when I think about it, because uh, I actually had, you know, started in San Francisco with the company in 2014, and uh, back then, you know, no one, uh, it was a lot, lot less well known, um, and yeah. I think, uh, you know, the company had just been valued at, um, had moved from two billion to a 16 billion dollar valuation just as I joined, um, and uh, we were really just building relatively quickly, uh, I would say. And then that maturity level, I had to catch up very, very quickly. And so anyway, I referred Martin in. He was coming from AWS at that time in, up in Seattle. Um, and we both just so happened to, I wanted to do more infrastructure stuff uh, because I'd been working on deep in the guts of yeah. these, these apps. And, and, and by the way, now that's fashionable. <laughs> Everyone yes. wants to do infrastructure, right? Come on. Yeah, yeah these back days. Then, don't talk speeds and feeds. What are you talking about? We love hardware. We love to build virtualization. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's that, that shift of IT you know, that, that you just mentioned before is like, um, you know, a testament to that, that now uh, folks know that if they're better at the infrastructure space, they fundamentally can be much more competitive, um, especially in a world where you know AI and your posture uh, around uh, being able to build complex dynamic features is so important, and and that's what kind of drove us to towards working on this problem at Uber. Um, and then you know we were building like a team within a team out of New York, with <laughs> thankfully distraction free compared to like uh, yeah, yeah. the and the no business drama. of there's no drama exactly. in New York, like a little getaway. <laughs> yeah, there was no uh, people rioting in front of the office. So <laughs> that which was honestly a pleasant um, uh, experience. We got a lot of quiet time in the mornings as well when you know as San Francisco was sleepy and no one was deploying app, apps and services. <laughs> So we got a few hours of quiet. Um, <laughs> Sneak a few deploys in. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. While it's all, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, calm sea waters. So no, we we uh, started building that. Um, and uh, honestly, we you know we got to the end of that mission. We built a entirely new, um, horizontally scalable time series database from scratch uh, because. The economics model, we realized we were a, a logistics company. We weren't like AWS or a cloud provider. Um, and we needed very good margins on our technology infrastructure to sustain our business as we move towards becoming a profitable business. And so, um, you know, right th around that time, uh, we were spending 10% on observability. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, the, you know, the on app money was or really time or both? on hardware. So the hardware that we deployed 
one in 10 of those servers we took out and we ran the observability stack on. So 10% wow. of our CapEx hardware, and we were That's on premise at the time. Yeah, wow, it was. Huge. It was It was a very expensive um, uh, time. And then so we wrote a, a new set of infrastructure, the database um, and an aggregation control plane. And then um, that brought those costs down to two to 3%. And that and then when we kind of finished with that mission, uh, Martin went to Seattle to work on some other interesting things at Uber. I, I went to the storage team and was gonna work on more hardcore database problems. Uh, but then then uh, we realized, hey, we're going to these conferences. Everyone's got the same problem like that we had in the observability yeah. world, and everyone is experiencing it really, you know, hard up against the wall. Um, yeah. Like we went saw Slack in KubeCon Barcelona in 2019, and they were just like, your your talk, everything is just like it's the exact same problem that we have here, yeah. and um, you know, we're having to cut cut back on developer productivity by limiting their data and observability data, so they can't yeah. see what's happening. And yeah. so that's when me and Martin knew, okay, we should really have a run at this thing. Um, and uh, and at a certain point, you know, the uh, the VC started sn sniffing that we had had, you know, been having chats. Um, and then uh, Jerry Chen uh, swooped in. Swooped in, he did. <laughs> Ahead of Sequoia, yes, very smart move. <laughs> did he get you guys for a nice scotch and bourbon in the, in the Jerry fashion? Uh, Jerry's a great investor. He's a good friend of the Cube too, by the way. We yeah, Jerry. Jerry's yeah. A, a fantastic product um, specialist and an yeah. operator. Yeah, we were, we were really lucky to be able to partner with him. And, and I do, do think that the term sheet was uh, verbally discussed at, at the um, there was a, there's a conference called Modern Armor in Portland at, at the Whiskey Library in, in, uh, yeah. in Portland, and th yeah. that is a beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go. Let's talk about KubeCon. I love the story of how you guys you know, did a, did a talk at KubeCon. Mm -hmm. I love that community. As you know, we've been there since the beginning. Remember when it was found? I was at Lou Tucker at an OpenStack event. He was at Cisco at the time. He's now retired. Mm -hmm. When the Kismatic guys were like, "Hey, mm -hmm. this Kubernetes thing," the paper was out from Google, mm -hmm. and I'm like, we were like riffing, like this could be really a big deal. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. To, I call it interoperation layer, but orchestration came later, but we saw the beginning of that platform, the, the failure of OpenStack to kind of, because Amazon was rising fast, and yep. OpenStack got smoked by AWS, basically. Yes. And so, you know, yeah, we know that. True. And then you guys were doing the work at Uber, and so, we, and then Facebook was doing their thing, Open Compute, I think, just started. They just That's did right. their first donation, Open Compute. I'm like, wow, this is going to be big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and think, like, what's interesting is that at Google, the engineers there, they already had an existing Kubernetes-like thing that was internally used yeah. and proprietary. And I think a lot of people were like, wow, they're building it again in open source. Yeah. You know, how's that going to go? Yeah, and exactly. then here we are now. Yeah. Obviously, it's uh, everyone, transformed Everyone the world. wants to be an SRE, but they don't have the SRE infrastructure, mm -hmm. except for like the use case like Uber. But I mean, like, IT was going to see this. Again, so this now comes back down. The interesting thing is that cloud developers start scaling up. Yes. So the, the combination of that, and this is where you guys came in. I like the story because when observability hit, it became like, oh shit moment. Like we should really, this is a key part of knowing yes. what's happening. Yes. Take us through that piece of it and how that impacted the builders and the developers and the container market. Because again, you know, Docker containers, they, Docker went through their life cycle. Yes. Okay, so you got containers mm -hmm. changing the role of containers. Uh, you got um, builders now, cloud native services mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are starting to pop a little bit. It's getting some traction. Take us through where this all connects. Yeah, it's so I think like the uh, level of services that, that uh, we were building over the last 10 years has just fundamentally been at a higher level of expectation for mm -hmm. reliability, um, complexity, and uh, it that is that is being radically accelerated by this shift to containerized platforms. So, you know, to put it into some numbers and context, um, a few hundred microservices uh, was uh, then deployed to, you know, tens or hundreds of, of containers, and suddenly you have tens of millions of independent containers all running on a platform where usually you had a few hundred, you know, uh, yeah. either virtualized hosts or, or real serv server hosts. So that that is um, you know two orders of magnitude higher levels of uh, little tiny units running around in this backend systems. Thanks to Kubernetes, mm -hmm. thanks to containerized workloads, um, and so that fundamentally meant it was a lot harder to keep the reliability where it needed to be. And uh, and and you know at, at Uber, like a ten minute outage, that's millions of dollars uh, lost 
plenty of drivers out of work, right? Um, yeah, no downtime there. No. You can't have it. Yeah, the, the, the Twitter fail uh, whale of, uh, you know, the early noughties. Like, they were running rails on AWS yes. at that time, if yes. you remember. Yeah, so the expectations are a lot higher than then, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I, think, I think that's what's really uh, shifted. If you want to be competitive, you know, it's, it, it, the impact is so much higher and it's so much harder to achieve. And so airlines are obviously, you know, a... a, a obvious one where it's like hey they can't allow their systems to go down but they yeah. need to build new features in a and okay so Rob, a, give us the update on chronosphere right now because you guys um have a really great team again solution it's well documented we okay. cover you guys on silicon angle in the cube uh, where are we right now in the progress part because again i mentioned mm -hmm. at the top it was acceleration for you know forget the fashion wars guys we need stability yeah. we got to get the foundation built because the pressure to roll in the new data models and scale up the new clustered system servers for mm -hmm. performance mm -hmm. needs to power these gen ai apps so the cloud native services will be powering yes. a lot of apps yes with exactly. a gen ai in, uh, injected into it so mm -hmm. this is again let I me mean, go back to kubecons ago there was no discussion because gen ai was launched before the call for papers was already uh, <laughs> aggregated so that one yeah. kubecon it felt like yeah. the obvious elephant in the room is no one's uh, Gen AI talks. Yes. But yeah, ChatGPT is launched. Yes. Um, and so now, you know, almost two years in, mm. I'm expecting to see a lot of Gen AI at KubeCon in Salt Lake yep. City. What, where are you guys at? What are the hard problems you're solving? What are the, what's the progress? Give us an update. Yeah, yeah of course. So, uh, yeah, no, we've been um, basically, obviously, focused on the large born in the cloud. Uh, a set of de the demographic of, of those um, organizations and companies. And, and then we've been shifting recently into um, creating a further foothold in the enterprise space because enterprise are now adopting these technologies yeah. at scale. And also uh, AI infrastructures, uh, startups are, are a big one for us because you know these folks are building large GPU clouds <laughs> and yeah. uh, they yeah. have large um, monitoring and observability needs and they've got a lot of customers moving their, um, their apps around inside of their own platforms. And so, uh, so that's been a, a shift for us in the, the demographic. Um, we've also been building you know, features to help streamline a lot of that, uh, those new, what I would call new observability work, workflows. Mm -hmm. um, because yes, the, the, uh, what I think is going to continue to happen, like we have a bunch of these new AI developments, but not a lot of people understand, okay, well, how is that how are they arriving at decisions? What is the advice that it's giving to our own customers? And what's going on inside the box? Yeah. And so a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the AI understandability yeah. uh, problems have started to explode. And so, because you are architecting your apps differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you're calling uh, your a you know, your, uh, your AI provider, whether that's like OpenAI or Anthropic or Gemini and Google, um, or you're low, you know, maybe you're running your own models, um, fine tuning them. You're also doing training and training workloads, almost like a shift. It's almost like a, a second shift of big data. So big data created like a, yeah. a whole new function and, and um, obviously a, a set of roles, an entirely new um, way of doing things. But uh, AI is similarly too, like this, this muscle to be able to fine tune architects and then operate in production without, you know, AI kind of uh, making life worse. Um, so you, if folks really are yeah. trying to dial in, make sure they launch things that save people time, not waste their time. Saving time is key. Well, how has observability changed with Gen AI? Has there been any um, forcing function, changes of behavior, changes of needs? Yes. What are some of the things that Gen AI has kind of brought to the table? Good, bad, and ugly. I mean, how would you? Yeah. I mean, that, is, that, I mean, change is good. We and you have to get there, but what? What's it pushing? Yeah. What are the key constraints and what's the, it, it's a forcing function. What's happening? What's the key areas that's being impacted the most in observability? So I think what you've, I mean, there's two major themes and, and it, it's interesting because we were talking, I think just before we, we kicked off around like there's AI for networking, networking AI, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's kind of similar in observability. There's, <laughs> there's observability for AI and yeah. then there's AI observability. And, and that first one, um, uh, AI uh, observability, I think, is uh, you know what I was just touching on. We were just chatting about that just now in terms of like you need to understand these new architected AI yeah. augmented systems. Um, but then on the AI observability side, you know, I still think that the, it's it's kind of early days. I would say, yeah. um, and uh, on, what we're seeing from a lot of um, 
the market is that people are setting aside budgets for uh, expansion into um, buying uh, AI-enabled uh, observability tools. Yeah. Um, but n no, there's no clear, obvious uh, architecture or solution yeah. or vendors out there that are doing it well. Yeah. Um, and so we- And it is new, it is new. It is very There's new. There's no real patterns or loops identified to kind of lock in on. Yes. And uh, they're emerging. I mean, right. we're hearing stories yes. like, okay, I mean, you need, data, agents, you need data yeah. to run AI, right? Yes. Like, so like, yes. is there reliable, repeatable data loops mm -hmm. that could be identified yes. in the observability area? Yeah. And when then what part of the stack is it? Well, that's what we're kind of um, finding is that actually tracking some of the, the usage data of your power users and then kind of suggesting to your, your own end users, hey, the, um, the principal engineer at your company, when he or she sees that alert go off, they, um, you know, she might go to a dashboard here, she might go and look at some logs, she might look at some traces, and these are the common things that she does when she responds to an incident. And so it, it's kind of streamlining this, this process, but it still keeps humans in the decision-making role. Whereas like there's some people out there thinking that, oh, you're just gonna be able to have S, you know, um, autonomous agents just operate the system for you. I no. don't think anyone's no, buying that. I mean, I don't even see any semi-autonomous. Right. I mean, right now, <laughs> let's get some Gen AI going. Yes, and, yeah. You know, it's funny, I was I the last guest on who's doing an awesome area in healthcare, insurance, you know, workflows. You know, we were just talking, get on base, yes. hit the single, don't hit the home run. There's no home run to hit. No. It's unattainable. Yeah, You've got to get wins. Yeah, I think that, like, people are pragmatic these days. You know, it's not yeah. about... Especially in platform engineering. Yes. Zero tolerance <laughs> for any... I mean, making mistakes is tolerance for learning, but, like, there's zero tolerance for self-inflicted yes. mistakes. Yes, yes deploying terrible AI. Yeah, no, I think that, that, and that's why I think AI observability, the first category is 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 probably the place where the sector's um, focused on right now, um, but definitely the uh, Mainly because it's low-hanging fruit you can go after. Exactly, yeah, it's low-hanging fruit and, and everyone needs to solve that problem. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they, they, again, to your point, the expectations are high and they need to hold themselves to a high quality bar. So talk about the platform. What's the new updates on de technically that you guys are working on? What are some of the benefits with customers? Take us through some of the current mm -hmm. um, changes, and if you, you don't need to spill any news on KubeCon unless you want to. Um. Mm -hmm. No, well, so. I, there, KubeCon's right around the corner, so my, about almost less than a month away. But yes. yeah, I'm, it's gonna be very exciting there. I'm looking forward to seeing it. But what, what's go going into KubeCon, where's Chronosphere at right now? How would you? Yeah. Peg your progress. Yeah, so we, we have some interesting uh, launch uh, product launches that we're going to be talking about that I've been told to button my lips on. But I can kind of uh, foreshadow a little bit. Yeah. Yes, what we're where the focus of the company is right now. So you know we stand out in the market because we uh, are basically have a lot of intelligence around how the data is collected and how it's utilized, and we do it efficiently. Again, what we did for Uber, where we you know squeezed that ten percent budget into two to three percent um, that that enables you know companies to operate far more efficiently um, and also it's it, it's built and architected in a cloud native space so it, it naturally solves the problems that yeah. you have in today's world rather than the old um, you know uh, pre-containerized um, experiences and platforms um, so we are push, f investing further in that second mm -hmm. category there mm -hmm. and um, we have basically uh, we're expanding uh, the capabilities of what we call Chronosphere Lens, which is essentially an opinionated look into the uh, the system that has a cloud, a natural cloud native angle. And so we want developers not to have to understand metrics, traces, and logs. They should, you know, junior engineers should be able to graduate out of college and just be looking at um, the system um, again, following. Uh, have hints about what those power users are doing, and then be able to go solve effective problems without knowing, yeah. needing to know tribal knowledge that is, you know, um, locked away in certain parts of the company. So we really saw so user what, experience is critical on that piece. Exactly, and that's where the investment um, ha has been around, uh, continued to be around, um, and uh, basically doing complex things like diagnosing different. Uh, um, deep dives uh, where that 
that your power users do, we're, we're making that one a one-click experience. Uh, so for instance, for a customer recently, they deployed their, all their infrastructure everywhere except Japan, and suddenly they saw there was issues happening. You know, they can click a button, and, yeah. and with the user stories, like, they easily notice, okay, Japan is the one that sticks out, and the build version is different, and then immediately resolve the issue Yeah, you, know, you mentioned at the beginning Kubernetes, and you mentioned Google, they had Borg, which was basically their internal Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Platform yes. engineering continues to thunder away mm -hmm. as a targeted persona in your area. Yes. Operators, these are operators, they're running operations. Yes. I put data engineers in that bucket, because I still think that Rob Stretch and I, on the Cube Research, talk about this all the time. We mm. Somewhat debate, I don't think we really debate, but it's like there's a data engineer that kind of looks like a platform engineer. Um, yes. In the sense of that's because, because they're not data scientists, that's a separate department. Not, they're not going away either. So no. there's this whole dogma that, whoa, AI is going to replace and change. It. No, no, no. BI and analytics yeah. dashboards will, they might consolidate, but that whole what's the state of the business is going to be there. Yes. But the engineering piece of it, there's an SRE like mm -hmm. yes, site reliability quality, yeah. engineer for data where you got to say, okay, here's my data sets. I mean, no one's going to build a time series database from scratch like you right. did at Uber, but the, <laughs> the point is you understand diversity of databases. Yes. That you can mix and match. I got a columnar store for that. I'm going to use some streaming data mm -hmm. here. I mean, it's a system architecture yeah. going on at the platform. So not only is cloud native KubeCon CNCF dealing with the cloud native surge, mm. you're looking at a system architecture view. Yes. So this is now an engineering thing. Yes. And I think those data engineers, are they were really important before um, AI's explosion, even furthermore so. Uh, and yeah. I think a lot of uh, these companies depend on their data engineers in increasing manners. Mm -hmm. And I think like that's, um, yeah, I, I, even though we have Snowflake and you know, obviously they're other just data lakes. platforms, that's exactly. Exactly. That's just the data yeah. warehouse in the cloud. Yes, and With I think, yeah, they're not solving everything. In fact, if anything is getting more complex, the yeah. different things and the special well, special you, you central repos are, are, are as well understood architecture, but you know storage, you work on storage. Yes. There's a difference between highly available and high availability. Right. And yes. latency <laughs> matters in AI. And yes. so when you start Freshness. getting into this operator mode where your large scale operations, um, it's a huge market in the enterprise. I mean, you got you just mentioned it earlier, like a lot of the work is done on these hyperscales and these large scale startups where the observability is needed because it's mission critical. Yes. They don't hit yes. their milestones, they don't get that cost overruns go crazy, they don't hit their revenue targets. Yep. And right now it's like red line, black line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, open AI can afford to lose billions of dollars because they're open AI. Yeah. But if you're another company, no. you don't can't be burning cash, you're your revenue, yes. that black line's yes. got to be profit and the yeah. red line cost got to be here. So you can't cross them, or yeah. if you have no plans to cross each other, yes. you got to get profitable, not profitable, but at least growing yeah. value extraction. Yeah, and I think so, projects in platform engineering fundamentally take a long time as well, like many months, rather than like products and features can be shipped actually quicker, I would say. And so the diligence level does need to be very high on these investments from platform engineering teams. All right, so let's talk about the enterprise, because like enterprise, we were at IBM last week, they had the big analyst meeting, all the top execs came in, um, but they did float a study that said McKinsey mm. predicted, predicts, mm -hmm. or says, in their research, 1% of enterprises mm. are using AI right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep. So I'm a cloud native there. There's some work going on. They have cloud and cloud operations. There's a lot of on-prem action. Yes. All cloud oper. It's becoming cloud ops. I consider that cloud in my mind. Distributed computing. Call it just, we'll call it distributed computing. AI is coming in fast. Mm -hmm. What are you guys bringing to the enterprise right now? So big market opportunity for Chronosphere. Yep. So it is. check the box there. You're, <laughs> you <laughs> guys the, still got a big market you're going after. Yes. How, what observability DNA and mm -hmm. capabilities are you bringing into the enterprise? Yeah. As they start to realize that, well, observability is a key ingredient from day one built into the plat platform re-engineering that's going on. So basically, uh, the the enterprise has a lot of things that are still in um, you know outside of a cloud native environment. And while the shift is still ongoing, honestly, even the shift for for enterprises um, in just to the cloud in general has been and not as fast as we would have thought. Actually, like ten years ago, I think we would have thought. 80% of them would be there. That's not the yeah. case. Um, yeah. But it means that when they are doing their migration now, they're going straight into cloud native. They're not yeah. taking the intermediary step. And so um, yeah. we, we acquired a company called uh, Calyptia uh, back in uh, late last year. And um, they ba we basically have a second business line now uh, called Telemetry Pipeline. And that helps them basically manage that data on both in on premise as well as in their um, their new cloud cloud native environments, yeah. and so a lot of uh, the control plane in the brains can push 
that data, uh, the, the config and the desired refinement of the data and uh, collection and routing of where the obs observability data is going into different formats, different places where you can do then learning on it yeah. and uh, you can do your SIM access and, and security posture um, uh, analysis hmm. um, and so basically we, we are making it a lot easier to actually adopt cloud native um, architectures uh, move data around move from one logging platform to another uh, without having to go and rewire all of the systems under the hood so you're por porting a lot of data around yes we're moving a, a lot of data around a, a lot of the time folks they bring on telemetry pipeline they don't move the data around at all, but then once they're on telemetry pipeline, now they have a they configurable the data. system. It's not data movement in the sense of a cost, but it's like yes. data access. Yeah, the accessibility is you know 10, 10 times more accessible because you now can push a button and route it somewhere else, and you can start using new tools like our Chronosphere Observability Platform uh, to start using some of that old flows of data, because now you can route it in different places without interrupting your existing workflows. Okay, when you go to KubeCon next month, uh, less than a month away, um, I bump yes. into the hallway, not me, but um, you know, yes. a friend. A few of us, yeah. And you say, hey, what's the update? What are your top three accomplishments since the last KubeCon? What's the, what would you say that since last year? What's the top three accomplishments at Chronosphere? What did you guys mm -hmm. knock down? What did you accomplish? I would say, uh, you know, the, the enterprise segment is uh, a, a huge uh, growing segment for us. And we have now really... Uh, turn the corner of being known for our initial core technology around um, you know industrial scale reliability and cost efficiency into a um, into a model that really does rethink how data uh, observability data is laid out and lets more people use it in cloud native environments whereas a lot of the time you know existing companies are uh, they're using their old solutions in the new world, and it's just, it's too complex. Right? They, they spend all this time, the product, you know, the developer productivity is, is really low. I like to say that we're moving to a world of, instead of move fast, break things, it's move fast, break things, but immediately have the systems auto correct. heal and correct and, re and recover. So yeah. that's, that's what I think we've really shown the world. You know, uh, DoorDash is a big customer, Robinhood, a lot of technology you first companies. You guys have huge customers. Go, go down a yes. few of the list you can say. And then Rubrik is uh, like one of our new um, large enterprise customers. Uh, and Boxes is a, another big one. Um, and so that, that, that's our growing segment there. Um, and, yeah. and I know that I think Rubrik was just here ringing the bell like yeah. uh, there, anyway, six months listed ago. They're company. Yes. Um, so that that is, I think, like a huge thing for us is that we're really in that growth stage of accelerated um, enterprise penetration, uh, and and of course the second major thing I would say is with a second business line in telemetry pipeline that allows yeah. us you can actually use Chronosphere telemetry pipeline, but still be using you know your, your Splunk or or another observability solution. You still get a lot of value and a lot of those cost efficiency savings. And then if you need the modern uh, platform and, and streamlined, you know, we're, we're adding obviously a bunch of generative AI streamlined workflows uh, into the, the observability platform. So as you so adopt you're more- a pragmatic approach to AI, like, like yes. security is the same way. Yeah. I mean, cloud native and, and uh, uh, platform engineering and security all kind of have the same posture. Yes. Yeah, we love yes. AI, but we're just not gonna, we're not deploying it full scale. We're gonna be pragmatic about it. Exactly. We're gonna use it where we're very confident. Yes. We can be enthusiastic, but no, confident. Yeah, and yeah, I think locked down. Well I think I think we're yeah. also showing the insights and allowing people to go, okay, not that one. Like basically self yeah. kind of learn from user behavior of directing and guiding the AI. Yeah. So it's kind of like if you're thinking of an autonomous driving car, you know, the car might suggest, okay, three lane changes this way and then a right. Or to or get off of the next exit and and t take a left and do a loop. You as a human get to choose which one, right? And you kind yeah. of can see the impact of each what the ETA is. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like humans need to make the decisions. Yeah, human in the loop is critical. Uh, you mentioned I want to close out with one point because I think this is something that comes up a lot. You know, if you go back a few years, I think I talked about with Martin about this with Jerry, um, on the on the first Cube interview. At that time, mm. if you just had the word O oh, and observability, you got funded. It was a different time. It was, it was yes. very frothy. It was a frothy uh, market. Frothy. Yeah. A lot of those companies had fell by the wayside. There's yes. still a competition. Yep. Um, there's a lot and, of consolidation and, that's happening. And so there's yes. kind of like people can play together. So you mentioned you can integrate with others. Yep. But I want to hone in on productivity, developer mm -hmm. productivity, because I yes. think that's the KPI for me that jumps out that says the difference between productivity should be the, the baseline. Yes. Yes. And how do they judge that? So 
How would you say, I mean, I, I, you could say this one, hey, the best solution should make the developer the most productive. Yes, absolutely. And, and make that claim. Yes. That's good conjecture. Yes. How do you prove it? I think there's like some really obvious ones that I come, you know, we, that we tracked at, at Uber and sometimes at Microsoft as well, but like the releases were slower there. Uh, number of releases that are rolled back due to a fault. Um, that I mean, obviously, you want to reduce that to zero, right? Because if you're if you're rolling back a a, uh, a fault that that broke something, now your developers have to go back, understand what happened, try to roll it out again, and you're basically redoing work. It's like redoing your homework, you know, and, and it's it's not not useful for anyone. Yeah, no, it's uh, a pain in the ass. No, yeah. no, no, no one likes that. <laughs> no one likes that. Like, that's that's a toil, muck, whatever word the cloud guys use. It's undifferentiated heavy lifting. Exactly. You know? it's busy. No one likes to do busy. It's, it's, it's minus. Work. It's negative difference. Exactly, and it's negative work. And morale yeah, gets yeah. impacted, right? So I would say, yeah, the, uh, the number of rollbacks um, or, or also the number of uh, minutes spent in these tools. Actually, our product team is like, how do we actually measure success of the platform? It's like, you can't measure time using Chronosphere because actually if Chronosphere is working great, your engineers are not being distracted all the time by alerts going <laughs> yeah, off yeah, and, and, exactly. and monitors. So, so number of pages is another big one. Like how many high urgency pages? How many times did a phone wake up a human? How many times did a phone yeah. interrupt um, them? Uh, like a, a, you know, uh, your engineers and your product people during the day, um, business hours. Those are two other great things to track. Measuring productivity, developer productivity is a huge deal. Great insights. Mm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, hey, see you at KubeCon in Salt Lake City in Perfect. a couple of weeks. Yes, I look Rob, forward to congratulations. it. Congratulations. Chronosphere, check it out. Great company. We've been following them from the beginning. Again, we're seeing mm. the progression now move to the enterprise, certainly from the wave of the cloud. You know, the big companies that made their own infrastructure like Facebook, now Meta, Uber, they're leading the way. They built the large scale infrastructure to handle a lot, a lot of diverse things that will be needed in this new era of agentic and AI systems because it's a data problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a risk management problem. It fundamentally <laughs> is. It's like, okay, I mean, no matter what you're in, so get it right. Rob's expert in the area. Of course, we're the Cube. We're here getting all the data, sharing that with you. Mm -hmm. Of course, go to siliconangle.com, thecube.net. Check out thecubeai.com. That's our mm -hmm. neural network. That's our retrieval uh, AI system. All of these interviews are vector embeds. Check it out. Thanks for watching. We are here at the NYSC QB Studios.